All right, greetings, everyone. Welcome to the Richard Dolan Show, where every week we fight the good fight. Happy to be here with you. So I'm going to uh, talk about something that I actually did for my website, Richard Dolan Members, just a couple of days ago. Some speculations on alien psychology. And uh, I was actually really grateful for a lot of the feedback that I got from uh, some of the folks who are members of my site who listened to what I had to say then. <clears throat> and I've incorporated some of those insights into this. I think that makes it quite a bit stronger. And I want to give a special thanks to those folks at my website who, who helped out with that. That was really great. So what I have to talk about is highly speculative, obviously. I mean, by its very nature, this whole line of thought, you know, you could, you could call it a crapshoot. How can someone, how can anyone discuss the psychology <clears throat> of beings that y you've never met or observed? I mean, I've not met aliens, uh, not to my knowledge. I've, I have no memory of such a thing. I haven't observed them. And you might think, well, that's kind of uh, presumptuous of me. But here's the thing. Like, Many of us who've studied UFOs for any period of time do believe that there's strong evidence that we're dealing with beings that are not from here, we can say. And I personally do believe this. And furthermore, I think the most likely answer to at least some of the UFO phenomenon is that we're dealing with extraterrestrial beings. So that is beings from another planet from somewhere else in our universe. There's always talk about dimensions when you get into this. And there's no question that there may be good reasons to think that somehow these beings can deal with dimensions in ways that we can't or at least don't fully understand, at least at this time. However, I don't think that should necessarily be exclusive to something extraterrestrial. I mean, first of all, we're now at the point in which it's become obvious that there are a virtual infinitude or nearly, I mean, millions upon millions upon billions of habitable worlds, um, even in, in our own portion of the galaxy, much less the remainder of the galaxy, to say nothing of the universe. I mean, life seems very likely to be everywhere around us in the cosmos. So that said, it seems easy to consider that, you know, a number of civilizations have arisen and that some of them have developed the capability to go beyond their world using means that we haven't yet officially and maybe probably figured out. Uh, that could be technological for sure. And it could also include some discovery in physics that we haven't yet learned of uh, that would enable them more easily to get here than we can go to wherever they are. Again, all that speculation, but it doesn't seem illogical to me. And when you look at the details of, well, first, the long history of UFO reports, and second, the long history of claimed interactions with non-human beings connected with UFOs, then I think we can at least look at that evidence and make some inferences. And that's what I want to do here. But before talking about the psychology of any aliens that might be visiting us, I think it's a good idea to get a baseline, so to speak, by discussing a few things about human psychology. For me, I like to start with the basic biological fact. We are mammals. We are born from mothers, and we typically spend our earliest months or years nursing at our mother's breast. And even if an infant is bottle fed, I mean, it's almost always going to bond closely with its mother and hopefully with its father. I realize this doesn't always happen with every child. And when it doesn't happen, it's always sad. It's tragic. But it's our natural way. It's how we are designed to be under ideal or natural circumstances. And I would say it's the case in the majority of you know, instances of, of uh, us humanity. And I think that's a very important fact. What it means is that we grow up with certain psychological needs and drives. The drive for love being pretty obvious. I'm not a psychological professional, but I don't think that's a controversial thing to say. And we have other emotions. We experience anger, of course. That comes in different amounts for each of us. I have no doubt, in part, as a reflection of whether or not the child actually does receive the proper kind of love and bonding that it needs. But obviously, there's more complex reasons for emotions like that. Anger, happiness, fear, curiosity, and all the others. Yeah, it's complicated. And as a matter of fact, our emotions are very complex. 
we often experience more than one of them at a time. You can experience joy and sadness at the same time. Think about that. We can experience fear or even dread, but also resolution and courage at all at the same time and a whole array of combinations. We can't really quantify our emotions perfectly, but we know them when we've got them. And the world of our emotions is so interesting and complex, and it really drives so much of our behavior, whether we examine those emotions or not. They're always there. They're always motivating us. And it's not just humans. Other mammals also experience emotions. Yeah, they experience them undoubtedly differently than we do, but it's obvious that dogs, cats, primates, horses, elephants, I mean, all mammals experience some form of emotional bonding with family and group members. They also visibly experience fear as well as other emotions like anger and joy. I don't know exactly what experts of um, reptiles would have to say about reptile emotions, but I think it's pretty clear that reptilian emotional range, if they have one at all, it's not anything like what you get with mammals. Reptiles are going to have a fight or flight instinct, yes, and so do fish for that matter. But that's very different from saying that they have emotions as we understand emotions. Reptiles don't bond the way that mammals do. They don't nurse their young. And for the most part, as far as what I've seen about reptiles, they don't seem to care for their young the way mammals do either. Now, evolutionary biologists will tell you that mammals have developed emotions uh, because it's a very useful evolutionary adaptation and therefore it's very biologically selected for. Emotions are also possible with greater complexity of, of the brain, but essentially it's an evolutionary strategy that works really well. It causes groups of mammals to bond closely as a unit so they can work together and that means they can survive better in the natural world. None of that is controversial, but it's useful for us just to recognize that basic fact. We are designed to experience emotions. And the way that we humans are designed specifically seems obvious to me that we've developed, um, we've developed a very deep and complex emotional life. We're driven by emotions all the time. So with that said, what of an alien species? And specifically, an alien species that is likely visiting us or being here with us on Earth. Well, let's look at the different types of beings that people have reported. So most obviously are the gray aliens, which everyone knows about. So regarding grays, you got tall types, you got short types, and there have been some variations even among those uh, specific subtypes. But it's certainly a good idea to be careful when dividing them up too much. Uh, there's, in my view, I mean, any, there's so much room for error especially when mental manipulation enters the picture, which it usually does. And that's an important point I'm gonna come back to. People have also reported other types. You've got insectoid types of beings, sometimes they're referred to as mantids or insectolins or uh, beings like that. There are also claims of reptilian type beings. And, um, and here too, there's not of just one type of description of any of those. And then lastly, you got lots of descriptions of completely human looking beings, many of those. So those are the main physical types that people have reported, although there's definitely a substantial percentage, let's say a large minority of reports of a much wider range of types of aliens. And you know, for me, it's hard to know what to make of all the variety. I have to assume that many are just completely spurious, uh, one-offs, uh, either from someone just making the story up and never underestimate that, or someone who's just very confused during the experience, uh, which happens a lot, I think, so that it's difficult to remember properly, or simply mind manipulation. There's definitely enough consistency, though, to think that we are seeing patterns here, but I, I really want to emphasize that we need to be careful before drawing hard conclusions. A lot has to be considered provisional, at least in my opinion. And then if this isn't confusing enough, uh, on top of this, there's many claims among people, uh, really for the last many decades, definitely these days, of non-physical contact, I guess you could say, with beings from some other place or some other dimension even. So that is either a telepathic contact or some form of spiritual connection without a being actually being present. To me, these are hard to consider on the same level as encounters that are physical or, or sometimes 
encounters that are remembered as physical encounters. Let's keep that in mind. Um, I was recently in discussion with some researchers. Uh, they're putting data together on uh, people's alleged encounters. And unless I misunderstood them, uh, they were getting something like 80% of what they were collecting to be non-physical encounters. And, and frankly, I don't, I don't know what to make of that. I don't know how much stock to put in all of those claims as genuine alien encounters, but I'll come back to that a little later as well. I mean, even now, like after all these years of, of wondering about this, I think it's, it's just hard to know what are we exactly dealing with. Aside from the fact that there's been a definite variety of types of alien, but there have also, you know, there's been, as I just mentioned a little while ago, some big variations within those groups. I mentioned that there are reports of tall grays and short grays, but even among tall grays and short grays, there have been some interesting variations among them, some with, in, with intense brow ridges, some without. Now, I understand that a species might have variations, but I really wonder about brow ridges. It's a very substantial thing for some members of a species to have and for others not to have. So maybe it's a case of a, what, a dominant gene or a recessive gene like our own eye color. But when I think about that, that seems to be very substantial. I don't know. I, that seems like too much for just a recessive gene type of a situation. Are we talking about a different species that looks similar, but that they're different? Or are we talking about some other major variation within one species? Or is this just a case of mental confusion following an encounter? We don't know. The mental manipulation has to be considered as a big factor. I think if there's one consistent thing in the accounts that most, uh, when we deal with most of these beings, it's that they have a strong ability to manage our cognitive and our memory processes. So the thing is, who knows precisely what we're remembering? And I'm not saying we're not remembering certain things accurately. I, I think we are, uh, but there's this factor to keep in mind. So let me keep talking about the grays first. So I think it's fair to say that most people who've thought about them have speculated that the grays, we'll start with the short grays, um, may well be the product of some sort of an artificial process. For one thing, I'm not sure that anyone's ever detected a gender with these short grays. No one's ever described sexual organs or distinct male-female typologies among them, at least not in any really definitive way that I've been able to see. Uh, frankly, they seem to be androids of some sort, and this is something I think many researchers have also concluded. I mean, after all, the whole body plan of a short gray doesn't, doesn't strike me as a naturally developed or naturally evolved body type. You got this head that's so massive, and don't forget, brains are extremely energy intensive. They're ex expensive. There's got to be a good reason to have such a big brain considering the amount of energy that it needs. And, and actually, it's not always a normal evolutionary need to get a bigger and bigger brain over time. A lot of times we forget we humans actually have smaller brains than we did 10,000 years ago. They're smaller because we don't, we don't require them quite the way that our hunter-gatherer ancestors did. Um, I don't remember the amount that is different, but if you basically, if you took like an ice cream scoop to it, one of your ancestor hunter-gatherer ancestors' brains, when I, it took that amount of the brain out, then you'd get our brain. That's how much less we have. Um, so all that makes me think that the grays are artificially engineered with those big brains for a specific purpose, which of course comes at the expense of their bodies, which seem hardly designed for things like reproduction or frankly, much else. They got legs to walk on, they got arms and hands to perform tasks, but not, you know, really not that all that impressive, frankly. None of that strikes me as a normal biological type of development. I, I would think it's genetically engineered. I mean, if they're androids of some sort, which is what it looks like, it would probably not be useful to give them a sex drive. I mean, there's a distraction for you, or even emotions, another distraction, since because these grays seem to be designed to fulfill certain functions and certain tasks, not really to follow their own independent dreams or ambitions. Now these short grays are definitely intelligent. They're more than capable of engaging in some form of either mental or technological control that enables them either to paralyze people or to control people neurologically. 
meaning you're not going to move a muscle if they don't want you to move a muscle. And there's also many instances of people with these beings who react uh, cognitively or emotionally in ways that are unnatural for them at the time. I mean, that is often being like unusually calm, considering the nature of having an encounter with an alien being with massive black eyes that would normally scare them to death. So there's a high level intellig of intelligence in terms of their ability to manage us, but very little in the way of communication or expression. It's not zero communication, but there's not a whole lot. So in all the witness encounters that I can think of, people really don't describe much in the way of personal communication coming from these creatures and very little in the way of emotion. So realistically, I think it's very difficult. <laughs> Try to imagine a gray mother nursing its baby. No one's ever reported seeing anything like that. And it doesn't, it doesn't look like as though they can do this, which means they may not bond with others in the normal biological way that we do. Maybe they bond in a technological way. Do you think something like um, the Borg in Star Trek? Is there a common neural link that they all share? You know, um, I might think the answer is yes. So like a hive mind, a group mind does seem very likely. And in fact, you get this from a number of abductees who've uh, had their own insights in dealing with these grays, but especially the short grays. So I mentioned I put this whole idea on my website a few days ago. And one of the members of my site pointed out that other animals also have a kind of hive mind, not just bees, which of course, yeah, so we get the phrase from. But you think of a flock of birds flying in an intricate formation. They all somehow instinctively can read or feel each other in some way and somehow react almost as a single mind. Um, I, I think there must, there are undoubtedly many examples of this in nature, of this kind of thing. So what that mental process is like is something that would be great to understand better. I would like to understand that, that's for sure. So yes, I think these short grays have some kind of hive mind. Um, that just makes sense. They, they're telepathic. So they seem to be inside each other's mind if they want. Maybe that's all the time. But, you know, this is different from the hive mind that you get with uh, certain creatures on Earth. Because this would be a hive mind that's operating with a very significant cognitive ability, it seems to me. Like, how do they make decisions, we might wonder. Like, how do they do that? I mean, you know, maybe uh, once as the minds combine, they might form a new kind of collective consciousness that they can all share. It's just a thought. Uh, and somehow th that um, that collectively acts as a unity for them to for them to make their decisions. One possibility. Or maybe there's a single being controlling the hive mind possibility. Um, or maybe it's an artificially intelligent program that does it. Like that's a real thing you gotta wonder about. Um almost be like, you know. They, they're serving their algorithm the way that we're now more and more serving our algorithm. That would really be kind of crazy to think about. But one thing we can say is that we humans have developed a very strong sense of individuality over the last period of our development. Now, I don't think this was really nearly as much the case in our earlier history, honestly. I've thought quite a bit about this now. I think it's something that's grown over time and really took off only in the last few centuries. I would say it was very low during our prehistory, our pre-agriculture, our hunter-gatherer period. Um, and, and I say that just because when you look at the level of uh, innovation, of tool uh, inventions and things like that, it's a much, much, much more stable, more, uh, the change by our standard is very, very low. So it seems to me that there's a, a much stronger collective sense and probably a much less of an individual sense. But I do think that once we started settling into um, communities, cities, things like that, that that sense of indiv individuality tended to grow over time. And I think it really took off in the last few centuries with industrialization, um, really with the development of what we can call liberal democratic ideology, frankly, that's a just cause it to expand ever more, you know, sense on the individual, individual rights and that type of thing. Um, you know, it's interesting to, to think in our long history, a strong sense of individualism is actually, I think, very new to us. You might wonder if it's an aberration. 
Or it could be that the individualism, which is very closely related to our incredible scientific development, um, you wonder, I wonder if that will end up being a temporary thing. This is just speculation here, like everything else I'm talking about. Um, and that, well, I wonder, can it, could it in the future revert to a more collective psychology at some point? Be more like the grays, I guess. But in any case, for now, we are highly individualistic, and these short grays clearly do not seem to be, as far as we can tell. So then there's the taller grays. Now, these are often described as having a powerful emotional effect on abductees. Not every time, but frequently you, you do get this. And often it's a feeling of love hmm, or something like love. It's very strange. I think it's very strange. Now, it's not always that feeling. It's not always love. But it's, it's a feeling of deep emotion um, and you could say love, that's with way more frequency than you would think on any logical basis. I, I find it very odd. And often this feeling has been described as like very intense, very powerful. In some cases, people have described it as, as maybe the most intense or beautiful feeling of love they've ever known. That's just incredible to me. So I want to say something about this. So you think about meeting with a being that you've never seen before, or at least you don't consciously remember seeing before. It looks like a tall gray alien being. Some of them almost looked insect-like in appearance, right? So normally our human instinct would be to recoil at a being like this. I mean, look, uh, I mean, most people have some kind of aversion to any kind of insect uh, and you know, the larger, the worse, right? So, but without a doubt, a large being with with big black eyes or or a head similar to a praying mantis, I mean, that's just normally going to freak most of us out of our skin. And yet in this case, you're you're drawn to the being with a feeling of intense love and of being loved. And again, I, I just want to point out it's been reported more than a few times, quite a few times. So just stop and ask yourself, how normal is that? How likely is that? Being looks like a big insect sometimes. Is it possible for insects to develop deep emotions? Well, I mean, I can't say definitively that they can't, but I mean, certainly there's no evidence of that type of potential among any insect species that we have here on earth. They don't operate that way. Emotions, the way that we understand them, again, I'll say this, it's, it's for mammals. So now, is it possible that this tall gray being or this insectoid creature um, naturally in the course of its uh, development has genuine feelings of emotion and love? And then after they covertly abduct you, in which they take you from your bedroom or your home or some other place, wherever you are, they take you, they just naturally exude a feeling of deep love because that's just how they are. They take you, but they love you. I don't know. And meanwhile, there's nothing in your memory about having a relationship with this being. So how, how could you have developed a relationship with this being that would be, be based on something like love? Does that even make sense? To me, it does not make sense at all. To me, if someone experiences this feeling, it's I would say it's much more likely a form of emotional manipulation. It seems more likely to me that these beings just know how to push our buttons they know how to trigger the necessary emotion in order to control us. I mean, after all, our human military and scientific work on the brain and work on emotions uh, is moving very, very strongly in that direction. I think they've made some very big breakthroughs. So why not highly intelligent aliens who are studying us? In all cases with these grays, short, tall, all variations, there's never an outward facial expression of emotion, not in the eyes, not in the mouth, not in body language, at least not that I can remember. Other animals on earth, they're able to express emotions in their eyes and other actions, not these beings. It's all, everything's through the mind. And the only messages, you think about this, the only messages that people seem to report from them when they do at all, they don't get messages all the time, but they uh, sometimes do, are like these most trite, and meaningless statements like, you are special, we love you, you know, things like that. And I wonder, like, did these guys go to bad boyfriend school to learn these pickup lines? 
to my knowledge, these are not examples of genuine, meaningful statements of love or of deep emotion, you know, something that actually means anything. Love isn't just expressed by a telepathic feeling that invades your mind. It's expressed through actions, you know, and just what actions do these beings undertake to express their love for us? I can't think of any. They come in, they do their thing, they sometimes zing us with a love emotion or some other emotion, and then they're gone. Again, this sounds like lessons from bad boyfriend schools, like, sorry, babe, gotta go, it's been real, later. You know, not really what you'd want in a positive relationship. Now, the taller grays, and also accounts of the um, very clearly insectoid type of beings um, that have been observed, and, and, and sometimes they, they look similar, and, it, and sometimes they, they're very distinctively described, but sometimes it almost seems like a little bit of overlap. It's hard to know what you're really getting sometimes. But those types of beings, aside from the whole uh, occasional love feelings that they give, they, they definitely have been observed to have more of a sense of individuality among them. So there's more of a sense that they think for themselves. Again, to the extent that these stories are credible, and again, even the best of these accounts are susceptible to at least some amount of mental manipulation. We've always got to keep that in mind. But even so, we, we do see, if we if we um, go through those accounts, there is enough consistency that we can see evidence of a hierarchy in their society and, and possibly of decision-making ability. I'm not sure, but maybe a little bit like when you think about it, I'm not 100% sure that they show evidence of doing uh, human things like changing their mind or seemingly make an on the spot decision. Maybe a couple like picking up Travis Walton after his near death injury might be an example. Like he gets zinged by a blue beam of light. They're like, oh, damn, let's get him. And, and so they make a decision. But I think mostly all of these beings seem to just be following orders. Another thing that's interesting to me, in all of the interactions that people have recalled of encounters with greys or insect-like beings, none of them ever mentioned anything like resembling a family structure. None of them have identified anything that resembles um, friendship. Not among these beings. I, I don't know of any examples. Yeah, you know, they're obviously capable of coordinated effort uh, and action together. They can work together. That's not the same thing as having a loving kind of relationship. So when I think of the greys and the insect-like beings that are often seen in connection with them, um, sometimes they're separate, but a lot of times they are seem to be connected. I don't think of beings that think anything like us. You gotta wonder, like, how are they even born? Do they have a standard biological reproduction model like we do? If so, are they able to reproduce while they're away from their home world? It's a good question to ask since we we don't really have much of an idea about how going off world might affect our own ability to reproduce or to do countless other biological functions that we take for granted here on Earth. Re reproduction might just be one of those things that cause a problem if we ever leave Earth. So what about these beings? You know, do they have sex <laughs> or are they grown in a lab like like what we already speculate about with the short grades, is, is that the case with the other types? Again, I don't know. So there are many reasons to see that these beings have a completely different psychology to our own. I do think that if they're interested in us, and I do think they are, that our emotions are probably one important factor that intrigues them because I think, I think there's good reason to believe that they don't have them, at least not the way that we do. I'm not saying they have none, but it's, I think it's a very different thing than what we've got. And I keep coming back to the fact that we're mammals. T to me, that's a very important fact. And they seem very different than that. I don't, I don't think that they're mammals. I, don't, I certainly don't think that they nurse at their mother's breast. Uh, and I'm not aware of anything in, in the research on this that accords genuine emotions to them. But they do seem to know how to get into our heads. Very interesting. And you think about uh, reptilian beings, and I mean, there's m fewer of those from what I've been able to find. And frankly, to this day, I don't know what to make of them all. It's not that I disbelieve all of those accounts. It's that sometimes I can't always tell how different, well, one thing is I can't always tell how different these beings are from other descriptions of gray. Sometimes, again, there's overlap. Um, 
definitely there's been some kind of in between creature descriptions that some seem somewhat like reptilians and some are like a gray. It's like, what are we getting here? I don't know. Other times you get descriptions of beings that are so reptilian in appearance that they they're described as like standing up, you know, crocodiles. I mean, with a snout and everything, and tails even. It's hard to know how to take some of those stories. Like they honestly sometimes make less sense to me than giant insects, if that makes any sense. Especially when you have a reptilian being described with these big tails. Like how in hell are you going to walk upright and still have a big tail? Doesn't make any sense to me. So anyway, I don't know what their story is on the reptilian. So I don't want. Oh my God, I was muted for the longest time here. And I do not know how long I was muted. Uh, anyone wanna just tell me real quick how long I've been muted? What was the last thing you heard me say? And I'm gonna go back. <laughs> quick, someone, give me a quick one. Where did I leave off? Long time, oh my goodness, I'm so sorry, everyone. Reptile, someone says, okay. Guys, forgive me. I must have hit a mute button on my microphone. We're just going to, um, we'll deal with that somehow Af after the fact. Maybe uh, my YouTube masters can figure out how to edit this. So let me go back to the reptilians. I'm going to go through my little, uh, my little notes here, uh, outline. So anyway, yeah. okay, here we go. So I'm talking about fewer, there were fewer accounts of reptilian aliens. Sorry, guys. Uh, and I was just saying, I don't know what to make of them all. I don't disbelieve all accounts of reptilians. It's just that sometimes I can't always tell how, uh, A, how different they are from greys. Sometimes they're described as very similar to greys. Uh, and then sometimes you'll get descriptions of reptilian beings that are uh, with like a crocodilian type of a snout and with a tail. 
And I think these things are supposed to be standing up. Well, how are you standing up with a tail? That doesn't make any sense to me. So I don't know what this story is, uh, but you know, is there is some kind of mental manipulation going on there? Is there something else going on? Some of these reptilian beings are described as having emotions. The main one uh, seems to be arrogance. And I just wonder what else is going on with them. Do they have that? Is this accurate? I do not know. I'm not here to say that people are making things up. But in my time of doing this, I'm, ju uh, I'm just saying I sometimes had the feeling that we might be dealing more with someone's dream or their fantasy state than the real thing. And um, sometimes I think that is the case. And sometimes I come out on the other side and I think that there's a reality to these accounts. So now let me come to the human looking beings. I'm glad you can all hear me now. Okay. Phew. That's crazy. It's always crazy when you do a live stream like this and then boom, you hit the mute. It's like, oh my God, how did that happen? Sorry about that. So the human looking beings. Now, you know, for the longest time, I, you know, I tried to ignore all of these accounts of human looking beings. I was like, come on. Uh, I wanted all aliens to look totally alien. I wanted them to make sense to me. And, you know, you get these human accounts and I'm thinking like, how, how do I make sense of this? I don't know. But the fact is there's many of these accounts. And when I wrote the alien agendas a year ago, I definitely included a lot of uh, thought and talk um, discussion about human looking aliens. So the thing is um, a lot of the descriptions of these beings are like they're pleasant. They're even friendly. Uh, quite a few predate the 1947 era of Kenneth Arnold or Roswell, and we learn about these cases years later. Um, you know, someone, when they're older, will say, yeah, I was a kid in a field. I stumbled across these friendly-looking people. Uh, they were repairing their flying saucer, you know, that kind of thing. Lots of repairing of craft back in those early years. And, you know, I mean, the people giving these stories often do seem very honest in their recollections. So it's not like I'm thinking they're lying. I don't know what to make of all of these uh, cases because it's like, are they all repairing their craft? It's a lot of those, not all, but enough that you, you really have to wonder. Um, so I don't know what to make of some of those early cases, but I included them in my book. I think some are at least worthy of consideration, but there are definitely interesting encounters, a few of which I have collected directly of totally human looking beings that seem to operate on another level. So my take on this is that some of them are definitely, these are real cases and they indicate the presence and let's call it infiltration perhaps by some group that does not want their presence here to be known. So often these beings are standoffish. They don't generally communicate very much. Sometimes they do, but a lot of times they don't. So I do think that there's a viable theory as to how and why there are human looking aliens, so to speak. And it could be for several reasons. So one, would be that they were taken, like our human ancestors were taken at some point in the past, whether it's long ago or maybe recently, doesn't really matter, and essentially bred or genetically modified uh, to work efficiently for some alien group that's here and they want to manage our world in some manner. Like, okay, I could see that. There's also more exotic possibilities, uh, hybrids, uh, which we get, you know, with alien human hybrids or even things like soul containers or even beyond. I'll come back to the soul container thing in a moment. Um, I might assume that human aliens, if we want to call them aliens, have mothers and fathers. It would seem reasonable anyway. Uh, I hope they have mothers and fathers. I hope they have families. I hope they have loved ones. Um, there are indications in some of the stories that witnesses re have related that this could be true, but there are definite indications that they're not like us also. So if they've been genetically engineered to have strong telepathy, for instance, and I, you know, there's many, many of these cases of human looking beings with very strong telepathy. So if that is the case, you'd have to assume that would have a very strong effect on their psychology as well in important ways. So there's also the possibility, and it's none of this is confirmed, that some of them live under deep cover here right among us. In that case, they could be living an almost normal life, maybe with friends, maybe with family, and saying that that may appear to someone. Of course, if that's the case, you might think, are there problems of loyalty and reliability that they have? After all, if you're deeply embedded in a society, is there a chance that you might go native and identify with the people you're working, uh, that you, you know, you're observing? Again, they're very speculative. I recall reading some of the research of the excellent Australian ufologist Moira McGee, 
um, Moira is just amazing. In her research, there actually are quite a few human looking infiltrators into our world. They've got jobs, they live just like the rest of us, but they're not us. So the human entities of these craft, presumably you would think that there are genetic relations. They're probably us, but with enhancements. That doesn't mean that we can easily relate to them. Uh, maybe we can to some extent, probably can to some extent, especially those who might be living here with us. There's so many of these stories. I remember getting, uh, coming across the fascinating story of a Mr. Janus I'm um, pretty sure Tim Good reported about this years ago, going back to the 1950s. This very bizarre man who has a meeting with uh, a close associate of uh, the late Prince Philip, a man named Sir Peter Horsley. And uh, that's a heck of a story, but there's a lot of these types of stories. So uh, when I wrote about this in the Alien Agendas a year ago, I speculated that all of these alien types, the human, the non-human ones, all of them, might very well be extremely conservative and they might therefore see us as a problem that needs to be managed. And I say conservative because if there's been any long-term observation of us, all right, I mean, observation that, what, what if there's been an observation that's lasted for thousands of years? I mean, sometimes we wonder about this, right? Then that is one extremely long timeline horizon and it's one that involves incredible adherence to a long-term plan. And something we just, we don't have that in our civilization, nothing on that level. We don't have long-term planning like that. Uh, you do something like that, that seems to me to require an incredibly, very like ultra steady leadership, the opposite of something volatile and ever-changing, which that would describe us, you know, volatile and ever-changing to follow through on a very, very long-term plan, uh, to me seems to require exceptional stability and conservatism in, in like the most literal sense of that word for a society. So I've wondered, like, could that happen if you've got a totally biological intelligence? I mean, in the, what you could theorize it if the intelligence can live for many centuries, right? a being that can live 500 years, a thousand years. All right, maybe, but that would still be a very, very uh, change averse being, it would seem to me. Or perhaps, and, and to me, this actually strikes me as more likely we would be dealing with some highly intelligent algorithm that runs their society, like I was suggesting earlier. Again, it's a crazy idea. Like, are they serve, are these aliens also serving the mighty algorithm? Now, all of these that I've talked about, they're all physical beings. You got human, non-human. But finally, you have these alleged non-physical entities, like disembodied beings, if that's what they are. Uh, sometimes people describe them as higher dimensional beings. And again, I don't know how to characterize what kind of psychology that type of a being would have. And I'm not saying there can't be such beings. Uh, I'm not saying that. A lot of people think, oh yeah, well, Dolan's only interested in nuts and bolts. No, no, I've, I've had some very bizarre experience in, experiences in my life um, in which, look, I mean, I don't know what my personal experiences actually were, but I don't think that they were alien. I actually don't, but I've had some strange things happen. Absolutely. And of course, you know, you go around the world, people have every family in the world's probably got their own ghost story of one sort or another, whatever they make of it. Um, Hell, I've even talked, I don't know if I've ever talked about this on YouTube, I've talked about it on my website, how the ceiling um, lights in my living room flickered rapidly the moment my father died about almost three years ago. I mean, that was an ex incredible moment and um, I don't know, I can't ascribe that to chance, I'm sorry. So there's some strange things going on in this world, but how the psychology of mind operates in that realm I mean, I don't have a clue. How, I don't even pretend to understand how that. A mind without a brain, I assume there'd have to be some other kind of organizing principle involved to mind, and I don't. I do not know what that is. I can be open to it. I am open to it. So if it's there, and let's say some of the people who talk about contact with these beings, let's say those are legitimate, then I just wonder what kind of psychology those types of beings would have. Are they guided by any principles of pleasure? I mean, I would imagine not physical pleasure like sex or drugs. They probably aren't motivated by fame. 
or by other types of ambition or by reproducing are they you know is that a motivation i don't really see how that could happen to be the case i really have i have to wonder like what would motivate a truly spiritual being i don't want to sound flippant but like do they sleep do they make plans for the future if they love how does that work People talk about agape, it's an Eastern term, describes a kind of love that a parent would have for their child or like a pure non-sexual love, non-physical love that you might have for another person. Is that how they operate? I wonder. I admit it's a mystery to me, so I'm not gonna try to figure that one out. I'm just gonna leave that one hanging there. So overall, for the physical beings that are apparently here, I will suggest that the non-human ones, all right, the greys and the others are truly alien in their psychology. I mean, alien to the point where you have to wonder if there could ever be a true mutual understanding. Like sure, they, they know how to manipulate our minds, like I said, but that's different. Maybe we can learn to do the same to them one day, but that's still not the same as understanding. I, I just think they operate very differently from us. Now, one more thing uh, about that whole thing. After I published these thoughts on my website a few days ago, another member of the site offered um, very interesting insight. So like if, if they are intensely telepathic, so that is if, if that's how they normally operate. And of course our abilities in this area are much more limited, but it would be like we're blind or deaf in, in a sense compared with them, you know, compared with this one skill that they've got. We're, we're handicapped. Uh, in all sorts of ways. So for example, what if having a long-standing, intense telepathic ability gives you knowledge about physics that we haven't yet grasped? Would they have an understanding of more esoteric matters concerning consciousness, right? Or even the soul? Would they have the ability to manipulate either of those things in ways that we don't understand? From time to time, we hear accounts of bodies as containers for them. Linda Moulton Howe's research, this is more than 20 years ago when she wrote about this, spoke about alien containers for souls. Crazy though that might prob sound, probably sound to some people. Is it impossible? Combine that with advanced cloning techniques and bingo, you've got another thing to think about. In other words, can they create a human body and then inhabit it? All right, so that might be going too far for some people, I get it. But we're living in a very strange reality here, and I do think we wanna look at all the possibilities. It probably isn't helpful to have the strong ideological bias in favor of a good alien or even bad alien conclusion. I know many people who want these beings to be good. I understand, they want that so much, and but as a result, they'll see all of human society as really bad, really messed up, and they pin all their hopes on the fact that some higher species is here to save us somehow, bring us into a galactic federation, help us ascend, you know, however they mean what that is, basically to bail our sorry asses out. I mean, that's definitely an ideological form of reasoning, and it strikes me as extremely utopian. I've talked about that many times. Now, it doesn't mean that you automatically go the opposite way and assume they're all evil. I don't, I don't think you want to make assumptions one way or the other, but I do think that if we're going to think this thing through, that is, we're going to think through the reality of UFOs and the likelihood that we aren't, that we're not making all these UFOs, right? That, that there is alien contact going on. And I think we need to take a more holistic approach here and really try to think this whole thing through without stopping ourselves just because an idea seems to be too radical to consider. I think it's more responsible to think through the possibilities based on as much evidence and as much logic as we can muster. So you can see, all right, this whole discussion in a way is related to the whole idea of good alien versus bad alien. In fact, when I did this for my website a few days ago, I was originally gonna do something on that theme and then it morphed into what I basically have been talking about here. But ultimately we do very much need to know, like who do we need to be concerned about? Do we need to be concerned about any of these, these beings? Uh, and who might be on our side? Is anyone you know here looking out for us? 
Are, are there groups that are here that are not here for our benefit uh, and might be planning to do things in our world that we don't like? And are there groups that may want to help us out? Uh, you know, anyone has been in this field long enough, you ask these questions frequently. It's the thing is today, like I don't consider this a hypothetical distant matter any longer. Right now, we are in the midst of a global revolution. That's another thing actually I discussed on my website and I'll, I'll, I'm gonna think about doing that here on YouTube here as well. Um, yeah, we're in a very, very big current global revolution. I think everyone can see that going on here and I, I, I will wanna come back here and talk about that. But one thing is clear. You know, we are, we are experiencing a shocking and dramatic transformation of our global civilization right now, right now. So it's worth asking if any of the visiting alien groups have had a hand in this transformation, because we need to recognize the fact that there are the, these two very, very big things going on, all right? One is the presence of these beings. They seem to be here. And the other thing is that we've got this global revolution happening right now. Is it, they're both huge. Is it unrealistic to think that there might be a relationship here? I don't think it's unrealistic. We have to look into this more and more. That's our mission moving forward. We've got to find out what is actually going on. There's a lot of other big things going on in the world, but I think of those two things as just absolutely massive. So um, I think that when you're talking about two such massive entities of, uh, you know, things that are going on, that there's probably a relationship. Well, that's all I got. Look, sorry about the, of, of, I don't know, it was, hopefully it wasn't more than five minutes of silence. Yikes. Had no idea. It's the mute button on my Yeti. Ugh. I, I must have been moving my hands and gone, boom, hit the, hit the mute. Anyway, I want to thank you for being here with me. I should add, uh, if you like the content on this channel, please do hit the like button, help me out with the algorithms and click on the notification. So at least you have the chance to catch a new broadcast when I do them. I don't know if the notifications always work, but it's what we got. So there you go. And if you really like what I do, please do check out richardolanmembers.com. It's, it's not just filled with my own work, which it is. I create new content there multiple times every week. Uh, but it's got so many amazing members there who also contribute through our forum and in an extremely active comment section uh, to my posts. So lots of amazing conversations going on there for sure. And I wanna give a special thanks to all the super chats. Very much appreciated. Thanks to all the members of the chat family here, being here with me live. Always a great experience seeing you all in there. And thank you again for letting me know about the mute, yikes. All right, hopefully that won't happen again. Anyway, that's it for now. Uh, look, before I go, no matter how difficult our world is becoming, all right, let's keep our chin up. We're not the first generation of people to face difficulties. Everyone before us has had their share of crises. We can handle this. We've got to stay strong. We've got to stay as cheerful as we can, not lose our heads, and keep fighting the good fight. Later.